shattering the silence around stillbirth. You're watching Five News tonight. We hear one woman's story of heartbreak and reveal the attitudes and comments that parents face. She just looked at me and she said, the stillborn doesn't count. Um, and that, that moment's just horrific because that stillborn is my son, he's got a name. We'll also speak to the man who's reducing stillbirths and helping families through pregnancy. I'll be speaking to our live studio audience and hearing your stories too. That's stillbirth, still a taboo, a Five News Tonight special. Hello and welcome to this special programme. I'm Claudia Lies Romar. Now, it's one of the most traumatic experiences anyone can go through. Every year, around 3,500 babies in Britain are stillborn. Now, the reasons are the subject of many studies and much debate. What isn't talked about enough, though, is how we, as a society, deal with it. How we can all help families grieve and cope with the deep and lifelong effects. What to say to someone who's been through a stillbirth and, indeed, what not to say. Well, tonight, we aim to shatter that taboo by talking. We're joined by parents who all have their own experiences and their own stories to tell. And we're also joined by one of the world's leading researchers into stillbirth, Professor Alex Hazel. Now, he's clinical director of the Tommy Stillbirth Research Centre, and we can start by speaking to him now, actually. And, and Alex, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. However, it's a question that not many people could answer or understand. Medically speaking, what exactly is a stillbirth? So a stillbirth in the UK, um, it describes a baby who's born before birth um, after 24 weeks of pregnancy. And in terms of the causes, there's still not much known about what, what, causes, what leads to a stillbirth. There's lots of different causes of stillbirth that we do know about, but there's also lots that we don't know about. And about um, one in eight stillbirths are still unexplained, um, which is a really high proportion. Um, we do know there's also risk factors for stillbirth. So we know um, that mums um, from um, certain ethnic groups have a higher risk of stillbirth. Uh, mums um, from uh, the poorest uh, uh, groups also have an increased risk of stillbirth. All right, so we'll be hearing um, a lot more from you throughout the show. But he has also recorded something for Five News, which outlines some of the myths surrounding um, those risks that he spoke about. And if you'd like to watch that, just head to our Facebook page by searching for Channel Five News. But let's now hear from one woman's experience of going through a stillbirth. Priya Vara and her husband, Kevin, lost their baby boy, Cheyenne, just last year. We'll speak to both of them in a moment, but first, some here's her story. It was the 30th of August, 2017. It was my husband's birthday. He had always said that he thought that the baby was going to arrive on this day, um, and I hadn't believed it. We had our nursery ready. Uh, we were looking forward so much to the arrival of this baby that we had waited so long for. So we finally made it to hospital and they started performing their regular checks. So they checked my urine, which was fine. They checked my blood pressure, which was fine. And then they put a Doppler device onto my tummy and they started moving it around and they couldn't find a heartbeat. So they wheeled me down to the birthing suite and five midwives were now present there. A young man wheeled a scanner into me and he started scanning me uh, to try and look for a heartbeat. It was at that point I looked up and I saw all five midwives' faces drop just one at a time. I looked at Kevin and I said, why are they looking like that? And the young man said to me, I'm so sorry. And I looked at Kevin again and I said, well, why is he sorry? And he said, your baby it doesn't have a heartbeat. He's gone. I looked up again and I saw Kevin and he just had tears in his eyes and he couldn't stop crying. I went from amazingly happy and elated and not waiting for the arrival of my birth to this dull, sad pain that just started to consume me all over. Priya, incredibly brave for you to talk about something not just so personal, but something actually not many people hear about. And I think hearing that story has just opened up, I imagine, for anybody who's watching now, just a whole new world for them in terms of what people go through when dealing with a stillbirth. Now, not only did you have to deal with that, but then you also had to deal with telling friends, telling family. So I think for us, um, 
as you would have had, it was Kevin's birthday on the day that it happened. So we'd started to receive lots of messages around, happy birthday, I hope you're having a new arrival today, have you got a surprise? And so we made the decision just to post something out on social media to say, this has happened, just please just leave us, give us some time and give us some space. Everyone respected that. What was probably a little bit harder for us is that my brother and his wife were expecting a child at the same time. So they were six months pregnant. And so we were very sensitive towards that and we didn't want to, what happened to us to impact them in, in a negative way. So we made the decision not to actually see anyone for a long time apart from immediate family. What that did though, it just made it that six months later when we were ready to see people, we'd come so far on our journey. People were still expecting us to be sitting, crying every day. And yes, don't get me wrong, we still cry. We still have bad moments. But those days have just turned into moments now. Um, we had lots of comments around, you can just have another, you can, you've got one already, you know, you don't need to, need to cry as much or be upset. And those are hard comments to deal with, but at the same time, people just don't know what to say, so it's the first thing that comes into their head. Well, pretty hopefully we're going to give some people advice on what to say and what not to say a little bit later. But anyone who has experienced a stillbirth will tell you that afterwards they're subjected to the same problems within society with unhelpful attitudes, the misplaced comments, the silence. Well, with the um, pregnancy charity Tommy's, we conducted an exclusive poll into what parents face after going through a stillbirth. We also asked nine mums to give us their own personal experiences and they spoke to our chief correspondent Tessa Chapman and just so you know, they wanted to share the pictures um, of their baby, something very common um, to anybody who has a stillbirth child. And you will be seeing them in Tessa's report. She looked perfect. She died in labor. And um, she was just a perfect baby that was ready to be born and live her life. He was seven pounds one, and he had jet black hair and rosebud kissable lips, a button nose, perfect fingers. I just remember what was going through my mind was like, oh, this is a mistake, she's gonna wake up in a minute. I was just staring at her like in my mind, like begging her to. Every day in the UK, nine babies are stillborn. We've brought together nine mothers who left hospital not with a baby, but with a photograph a handle footprint and some precious memories. The results of our survey about coping with stillbirth struck a chord with them all. Our poll found nine in ten women had felt lonely or isolated after their loss. While many were supported by friends and family, seven in ten said some relationships were negatively affected. Nearly half of those said loved ones didn't even contact them. We have lost a significant number of friends over this. They just couldn't connect to us or they couldn't speak to us. They didn't hear the screams. They just left us to it. And without the people who had come to connect with us, we would have absolutely sunk under the pressure of our loss. Whether at work, at family gatherings or out and about, our survey found attitudes of others increased the heartache. People don't know how to act. And some people would say things like, well, you've got two children, so at least you've got them. People said to me, oh, well, don't worry, you can have another baby. Well, firstly, that wouldn't have brought Alexandra back. And secondly, how do they know that? We had to have IVF to conceive her. And it can be incredibly upsetting to hear people say things that to you are insensitive. Things like, everything happens for a reason and you'll get over it, just give it time. You get through the first year and all you've done is survive the first year of a loss. It means you've got the rest of your life ahead of you to face more anniversaries and more reminders along the way. For me, it was the phrase, be strong. I always sat and wondered what strength to other people actually meant. Um, did they think if I was sat there, um, not crying, not showing any emotion, just carry along, carrying on with daily life, would that be that I was being strong? Laura was stunned by a midwife's comment when she became pregnant again. She just said, how many children have you got? And I said, two. And she just looked at me and she said, the stillborn doesn't count. Um, and that, that moment's just horrific because that stillborn is my son. He's got a name. He's, of course, he counts. 
Our poll found more than half of parents wanted people to talk more about their stillborn baby, to use their name. For me, family gatherings are hard because there's always someone missing. Um, and I just think they don't understand, so they don't acknowledge. Including Leo in, in everything we do or, or finding a, a way to involve him is something that's really important to us. Um, and it is always comforting when family and friends find a way to do that as well. Be honest, say I'm sorry. I don't know what to say, but I'm here and I'm listening and tell me about your baby. What, you know, what was their name? What did they look like? Um, the people that ran away and wouldn't talk to me were the people that, you know, our friendship really suffered because of that. Nine women, each with a different experience, but all changed forever by stillbirth. Some real harrowing stories there, and these women, they're here with us. We're going to hear a lot more from them a little bit later, but we also want to hear from you. Whether you or someone you know has been through stillbirth recently or indeed many years ago, do join our conversation by getting in touch. You can do that by heading to Twitter. You can use the hashtag still a taboo or just tweet us um, at five news at five underscore news. You can also share your story on Facebook by searching for Channel 5 News, as I said earlier, or you can email us on c5 stories at itn.co.uk. Well, let's hear more from those parents now and about some of the attitudes that they face. Um, I'll start with you, Antonia, just listening to you talking about screaming for, for, for someone to talk to. And you lost friends, and we're not talking just colleagues. These were some of the friends who were part of your, your, your wedding party. Yes, we had a lot of very close friends who didn't reach out, they didn't connect. They told us things like our grief was upsetting to other people, so we needed to deal with that on our own or they said that we needed to understand that they had a child and we didn't, so it was difficult for them. Um, I had one woman who was pregnant who looked at me like I was carrying some sort of awful disease and she wouldn't touch me, she wouldn't sit near me and she wouldn't even speak to me. Um, and that was deeply upsetting. Well, you would have had Elaine, your sister-in-law, very close um, family, but also, sadly, Elaine, previously, before Antonia, you also went through stillborn um, with your daughter, Reva. In terms of what people said to you, you spoke about people telling you how to grieve, what they expect from you when it comes to grieving. Yeah, um, I had one person who said, you know, you'll get over it, you're young, you'll have more children. You don't know people's story. It wasn't easy to conceive Rivka. I since had to go through IVF to conceive again. Um, and that was really difficult to deal with because it was someone who was supposed to try and help me. But then on the other hand, I had some friends who organized a meal rota for six weeks afterwards and who were there if I needed them. They gave me space that I needed and then they were there at the end of the phone when I wanted to speak to them. I mean, Rosalind, with your, with your daughter, Alexandra, you decided to, to, share, to share your daughter with other people by posting a picture of her on Facebook. And not only did you get a horrific response, but it was a public response as well. Yeah, and it was a difficult thing for me to post a picture of her because I knew it would be upsetting for people to see. And someone commented saying, that's disgusting. Take it down. Nobody wants to see her. That's outrageous. How, how did you feel? How did you react? What happened? Really shocked and upset. And I kind of, I felt like I kind of shrinked into my shell. and Didn't know what to say. And it had taken a lot of courage for me to post the picture and then to have that reaction. I mean, I did get some lovely reactions as well, but it's the, the horrible reactions that really kind of feels like it's a stab in the heart. I mean, Rachel, you lost your daughter, Florence. And for you, and indeed I have to say for, for many of the mothers here, it's that being honest and acknowledging the child, the child has a name. Use the name. Let's, let's speak about the child. Let's not forget them. Yeah, it, it was really important for me to, to use her name in conversations. And it, it wasn't something that occurred to me. I was... I was ashamed, not ashamed, but 
a, po a, bit, a bit like um, um, they were saying, um, I put her photo on Facebook and I was frightened of the reaction. I actually waited almost six weeks when, when we told people that she died. We just posted a picture of her, her feet mm -hmm. and that was sort of felt like the acceptable face mm -hmm. of, of what had happened to us. Um, whereas really, I, I should have just been able to post a picture of her straight away, really. Okay, um, Rachel, thank you. And indeed, all of you, Rosalind, um, Elaine and Antonia, thank you. I'm going to speak to the other mummies in a moment. Um, but first, I'm still to come on the programme. I'm going to be reading some of your messages and your experiences of stillbirth. We're also going to be discussing the lack of support for partners. Also, we want to find out about the groundbreaking research taking place to cut the number of stillborn babies. That's all coming up on this Five News Tonight special, Stillbirth, Still a Taboo. See you after the break. Welcome back to this Five News Tonight special, Stillbirth, Still a Taboo. Well, we've been hearing stories tonight of women who've been through a stillbirth and the attitudes they face from family, friends and even professionals. And we've asked you to get in touch and with your own experiences. Lots of you have been doing that. Thank you so much for that. Um, first up, Christine Shepherd said on Facebook that when, when my daughter was born asleep, I had no help of any kind. She was taken from us and I was told by nurses, never mind, you're young enough to try again. Thank goodness things have progressed since then, she says. And Nola Peacock says, my beautiful daughter, Sabrina. Now, she was born still 23 years ago in September. One of the most difficult things was being told by a family member that I shouldn't talk about it. Thank you for sharing this. And Lauren Jade Thompson, now she says, it's still very, very raw for me. Only eight weeks ago, my beautiful boy was born sleeping. But at this moment in time, I feel extremely lucky to have such supportive friends and family. Thank you so much for getting in touch with us. Please keep doing that. You're talking to us, sharing your stories is something that we're really hoping will change things today. Now, if you've been affected by stillbirth and you want to get some help or turn to get some support, there's also information on our Facebook page, including the number for Tommy's Charity Helpline, which um, should be on screen right now. There we go. There's a number right there if you do need any help and support. Well, it's unclear all of us um, can do more to help those who've been through a stillbirth, but the experience is one that can have a profound effect, often on the whole family. Well, in our poll, 42% of mums said that they'd been diagnosed with anxiety, depression or post-traumatic stress disorder following the loss of their baby. More than a third weren't offered any bereavement counselling. And it's often even worse for partners. 69%, more than two thirds, felt their partner didn't receive enough bereavement support or access to bereavement services. And when it comes to children, that is the brothers and sisters of the baby, 10% of mums told us that their children needed counselling. Well, it's clear and from those findings that not enough is being done to support those following a stillbirth. Well, um, Hayley um, joins us as well, one of the mummies. And Hayley, you lost your son, Noah, and that really did impact your mental health, didn't it? It did. The day Noah um, was born and died, the day part, part of me died too. Um, and my mental, physical, emotional status has probably been affected and, and will be an ongoing challenge forever. I had two little boys at home and I couldn't parent them. I was utterly devastated and broken because nothing prepares you to deliver a baby, kiss, kiss him and say goodbye. So anything, happy times, moments, holidays are always tinted with grief and sadness. Um, so I, was, um, I had post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and panic and I'll never be the same again, but it's just about learning to cope mm. and live. Laura, your, your first marriage broke down after you lost your son, Joseph, and you say that your former husband just didn't receive the support that, that he should have received. No, I, I mean, the loss of a child is so devastating that it just changes you as a person and you as a couple, um, and you're not necessarily the same person you were when you got together as you are at the end of the loss. So in terms of the support for a couple, I think there should be more in place. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, as the mum, I got quite a lot of help in terms of bereavement counselling and friends were so supportive and wanted to talk about it. And for my ex-husband, there was, there was nothing offered. And I don't think that men talk about it in the same way that women do. 
So he, it was kind of, he had to be strong for me, but inside he was still dealing with the loss of his son. Mm. David, would, would you agree with that? I mean, you lost um, your daughter Grace. It's very coming very close to the anniversary um, of her birth. And in terms of what, from your experience, and also from not just from the loss of your daughter, but actually you go around talking to other parents, um, dealing with um, stillborn and dealing with the loss of child um, early on um, after birth. In terms of the expectations put on men, what are you finding there? Well, tomorrow is actually, is actually four years to the day since my daughter died. And the day after uh, is four years since I held her in my arms, just begging her to open her eyes, thinking maybe this wasn't real. And I had to dress her. Uh, my wife had some complications, so I was left with the baby. I had to dress her, put her in a corner and leave her to go and support my wife, which is, it has a profound effect on who I am, uh, even now. The fact that I can't even put my children to bed and walk away, because I remember walking away from this cot and it stays with me. And all that focus had to be on my wife at that moment, and that was only right. But uh, the terminology is always about the mums, which is no bad thing. It's just not inclusive enough. And you look at the results of the survey and it keeps talking about mums, which is a good thing, but again, not inclusive enough mm -hmm. because um, men have PTSD too. And because we're expected to be strong, um, the problem is we've got the idea of what this strong strength is mm -hmm. wrong. And we think it means keeping it inside, not crying. Um, but do you know what? When I speak about... Grace, when I speak about our loss, I cry and I've made a policy that I refuse to wipe my tears because don't tell me I'm not a man, don't even think about it. But those tears are a badge of my masculinity. They are part and parcel of who I am as a man and I'm not ashamed of them. And I think more men need to be not ashamed of that for the benefit of other men to realize that being strong, strong doesn't mean being emotionally unavailable. And I just remember walking along the road thinking I was fine and passing one of those um, green things at the BT engineers work at and I was singing something was on my iPad and I just went bang and bruised my knuckles on this thing and I said I'm angry I had no idea but I'm angry whatever's in there will find a way out my director B saying I should give you a round of applause um, <laughs> Simon um, what, what do you think what was your experience so for me some people did reach out and did ask me how I was feeling um, but more often than not the conversation turned very quickly to has Antonia and you know, rightly, um, you know, she, she has been through a very traumatic, um, you know, delivery, but the lack of appreciation for the fact that this isn't a women's health issue, this is about the loss of a child, and we suffered equally in that, was totally missing from a number of people. And for us, we took a very strong line that we tried to educate people how to talk to us. We um, typed up our eulogy and we sent it around with pictures about Shoshana. We were very public on Facebook. And we gave people every opportunity to understand and to learn and to try and engage with us. Many people did, and for those that didn't, unfortunately, you know, it, it has definitely damaged our relationship. Well, um, thank you, Simon. Well, let's get um, back to somebody we spoke to a little bit earlier, Professor Alex um, Hiesel. Now, to many, I have to say, I think it's fair to say that he's a bit of a hero in his role as um, clinical director of the Tommy's Stillbirth Research Centre. He studies what causes stillbirths and helps to prevent them. On top of that, he also runs the Rainbow Clinic, which is at St Mary's Hospital in Manchester, which provides specialist care for pregnant women who've had a previous stillbirth. And Tessa went there to find out more. Just a warning, you will see a placenta in this report. Go and come through. I'll um, show you into the laboratory. The more we know about stillbirths, the more can be done to prevent them. And the placenta is key for Professor Hiesel's research team. So here's baby's cord where it comes in and spreads out into blood vessels and if you look, if we lift the membranes up, this is where the sac where baby would have been. They look into how it works, how it goes wrong and they use that knowledge to think up new tests, investigations and drug treatments for mums. Since we opened um, the research centre here, there's been a 22% reduction um, in stillbirths um, within our unit. We don't know precisely what that's attributable to, but a greater focus on understanding why babies die and focusing on mums who are at highest risk of stillbirth, we think has, has underpinned that improvement in our stillbirth rates. And that's the other side of Professor Hiesel's work, a clinic for pregnant women who have previously had a stillbirth. Like Hayley and Adam, whose son Joshua was stillborn, Edie and George are their rainbow babies. Our risk was increased because we were, we were so anxious. Anxiety, yeah. Um, 
and he, he was just amazing, wasn't yeah. he? The continuity of care is such that you see the same person throughout your pregnancy and they see you regularly so they can monitor um, different aspects of your pregnancy and make sure everything's going smoothly. And for us it was just peace of mind. There have now been more than 500 babies born through the Rainbow Clinic and their good work continues. Incredible work and Jess, you, you are one of um, Alex's patients and you had your, your second son Eli after losing um, Leo. But um, what was that like going through a pregnancy after experiencing stillbirth and how important was Alex um, to that? Um, I would say pregnancy after loss is probably of equal difficulty to losing in the first place. It's mm -hmm. People don't expect you to be so negative no. and to be so dark when you're pregnant. They want you to be happy and excited and doing all the normal sort of pregnancy type stuff. But it's really hard to allow yourself to believe that that baby is ever going to come home. You are just waiting for them to die. That, and is that very similar, um, Professor Alex, to what other parents tell you? I think it's just a real mixture of... of having hope and, 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 and that, that you're on one hand excited about having another baby but always being dragged back and until you hold that baby in your arms you just don't believe it's going to be there and, and to the extent that we've had to we've had got a kit in our rainbow clinic for mums who cannot bring themselves to go and buy anything for their baby. And you've been, you've been working in this area for 18 years now. How do you say attitudes have changed towards stillbirths? I think there's been a huge change um, and a lot of it has come about from people beginning to listen to parents' stories like those that you've heard this evening. I think 18 years ago we sat around, we said this is really sad, but actually there's nothing we can do about it. We can't improve the bereavement care. And it's just one of those things. And I think over those 18 years, things have changed. We don't accept this is one of those things. And it's not something that we can't, that there's things that we can do to improve care um, for parents who this happens to. Welcome back. If you're joining us on Facebook for this Five News Tonight special, Stillbirth, Still A Taboo. Now, we've been hearing stories tonight from women who've been through a stillbirth and the attitudes they face from friends, family and even professionals. Well, we're also showing this exclusively on our Facebook. And the great thing about this is that you can interact, you can get involved in the show. If you want to comment on anything that you've seen or you've got a story of your own that you want to share, just write a message in the box um, underneath and you can, and we'll um, do our very best to read them out um, on the programme. Now, some of you have been doing that already ready and we've got some fantastic uh, messages lots of you guys getting involved even earlier on today when we started posting these videos and sharing um, these parents stories and first up Stacey Petty said on Facebook that it will be nine years on Monday that our little girl Ela was born asleep in my eyes I have three beautiful daughters Ela my angel baby Maisie and Casey but sometimes I do say I have two as I don't want to have to explain to strangers what our situation was Wai Kong also said on Facebook, training needs to be provided to employers too. I found people didn't know how to react or what to say. People saying everything happens for a reason. Need to understand that it's not supportive at all. Meanwhile, Vivian Priest says the truth is people don't know what to say in those circumstances. They probably have very good intentions to say something comforting and sympathetic, but it just trips out their, just trips out of their mouths in a clumsy way. Now, if it's close friends, they too might feel more sadness than you realise. Well, let's um, take a little, little look closer at the care that's offered um, to parents um, shortly after stillbirth. Now, a new government funding um, should help improve consistency at maternity units across the country because it is so vital that parents are treated with the utmost sensitivity at the most difficult of times. Tessa visited one hospital that does just that. The delivery suite at Colchester Hospital is busy and noisy and not the right place for parents going through a stillbirth. On the floor above, I meet bereavement midwife Katie. So this is our rosemary suite. Um, this is a self-contained unit and it's away from the main delivery suite area and it's away from the postnatal ward. Okay, You've got the living room um, and then you've got the 
bedroom. Um, it's an area that the parents can stay in for as ever, however long they like. Um, we've also got the cuddle cot, which is a really important piece of equipment within bereavement care because it allows the parents those extra few days with those with their baby because it actually cools the baby down. The baby can just stay in there as long as they wish really. It's a time and a place to make memories. Parents are supported through practicalities too, the post-mortem, death registration, the funeral. But not every maternity unit has a suite or properly trained staff yet. Colchester's MP Will Quince, who used the space when his son Robert was stillborn, is fighting to change that. I didn't come into politics uh, thinking I was going to be a baby loss awareness campaigner and like so many in this field it was a personal tragedy that led me to it but I'm actually really proud of the work that we've done. We've set up an all-party parliamentary group. We've now got the government to give commitments in terms of reducing stillbirth 20% by 2020 and in half by 2025 and we're seeing improvements around uh, bereavement care across the country and now launch the National Bereavement Care Pathway. That means a proper plan for every family, both in hospital and when they go home. What we want to do with the pathway is join, join everything up so that the parents are the absolute heart of the care that's being given and that everybody holds them with kindness all the way through. Last week, the government agreed funding to roll it out across England, a welcome step after years of inconsistent care. Mm. Some really great work um, being done there to support parents, but as we've said, it can be a bit patchy across the country. Um, Jess, I want to speak to you because we've spoken previously about the support partners get or indeed don't get in some cases. And Jess, you're in a same sex relationship, so with your partner, a woman, what kind of support did she get? Do you think the dynamics changed there because she was a woman who didn't have the child? And I don't think her support that she was or wasn't offered changed because she was a woman and um, I think as all the partners have said it's quite sketchy for partners I think what it just creates is an extra layer everyone has different layers to their grief and the support they need because of their individual circumstances and for us that's one of them and I think the biggest thing for um, a woman that is not necessarily the birth mother my wife for example you don't have somebody you can relate to um, as easily as you can find in other situations because you need to see that there are other people like you out there that have gone through something so traumatic um, and that's what you don't see when I suppose your layers get sort of quite full. Mary welcome um, people already would have seen you in Tessa Chapman's um, piece now the work that you do, you actually, you have a blog, mm -hmm. which happened organically. It wasn't a blog set out to deal with um, having a stillbirth no. um, child. However, it has become that, and you used to talk a lot about your daughter, Poppy. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have that conversation to you and indeed um, other, other parents who's gone in touch with you? Um, I think it's vital. Like for me, I say that it's been like what's kept me afloat through all of it. I find that often um, the conversations are so difficult to have in person with people and in that becomes sensitivity to offending people or upsetting them with the things that you just really want to say whereas if I, I feel that when I write it just flows so easily and I can get out everything that I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and every level of emotion that comes with losing a baby at term and I just find it is easier to say and, and people often will message me and say along the lines of you just said it perfectly and you've said it how I've been feeling and then they'll share that and pass it on to friends because it's communicating what they want to say but it's like we're too afraid to say it because we don't want to be upset or we don't want to be made to be, feel silent in something that's so personal to us. I mean Hayley, we were just looking at these, these bereavement suites and providing better support um, for parents. Um, in, terms of, in terms of your experience when, when you've got baby Noah in your arms, how important was, was spending that, that extra time with him? When Noah existed, Noah was real, Noah was born like my other two boys, he was put on my chest, he was cradled, he was kissed, I examined his toes and his fingers and those memories are what I'll have for a lifetime, that's what I have of him till the day I die. So that was my day that I can always think where he was born and he died. And that's something I'll treasure forever. I didn't have a cold cot, and I think now... A um, cold cot, so if you could explain for those who... A, a crib where um, babies are kept cold, so you 
parents can spend longer with them. You didn't have that? I didn't have that, sadly, with Noah, and that's something I wish I had, but they weren't there when Noah was born. And I think it's wonderful what, what people can have now. They can spend longer with their babies, whereas Noah changed quickly, and I had to say goodbye quicker. I mean, Laura, in terms of your time with, with, with Joseph and also actually how, how the team who are dealing with you, the midwives, the doctors, is, um, what, what, what were they like with you? Um, I mean, looking back, actually, once I compared it to my eldest son, he was two at the time we lost Joseph, the difference was, was just huge. Um, one thing I noticed that when the midwives came in the room, when I'd had Lewis, they kind of came in and said, oh, he's gorgeous. And looked at him and with Joseph they, they didn't even glance over to him um, they were they focused on me, checked my blood pressure, did my temperature, just very medical um, with no real um, sympathy towards the fact that I had a child who was lay there beside me in a cot um, and I was also in a side room on a maternity ward so every, every time a baby cried I could hear it right beside me while my, my baby didn't Laura, absolutely shocking for you to go through that. The very place you think they'll be caring for you and, and looking yeah. after you best. Well, we have had um, lots of messages um, from our viewers talking about your experiences. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We had Yvina Senders um, said to us on Twitter that all hospitals should have a bereavement facility. It's a shame that this wasn't the case seven years ago. Meanwhile, Daniel Barnett said on Twitter as well, our family and friends were amazing to us and continue to be this very day. And John Roberts told us that we lost our son Thomas in May just last year. We had amazing support from the midwives at the hospital and we found that meeting with Sands helped. Some of our friends have stopped talking to us. That, that's incredible. Um, that that could even happen to anybody um, after losing a child. Please um, keep those messages um, coming. If we don't get the chance to, to speak, to, to repeat them, read them out here, not to worry. I think that the messages is, is going to be a crucial to su support to anybody um, going through this. Well, earlier um, we spoke about the wrong and right things to say to a mother or father who's um, suffered um, a stillbirth. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, Priya, in terms of your attitude, you just started back at work, is that right? And you sent out a an email. I mean, what, what did you tell your co-workers? So I was advised to send out an email um, just to let them know. People don't know how to act with you. They just don't know what to say. So it's worthwhile letting them know what to say. So I incorporated things, like in my office, I have a plaque with all of our names on it, including Cheyenne. I speak regularly about him just to let people know it's okay and you can speak about him and you can ask me what happened, I'm okay talking about it. Actually, as a um, follow-up to this show, Work actually posted something on their internal intranet just to let everyone know that it was on and it gave me the chance to let people know that I I'm okay and talk to me. I just want my son's name mentioned. I want to talk about him. I want him to live on. And I think everyone feels that way. Everyone just wants their children to live on. Well, it's, it's really good that and with this, you're also getting that extra bit of support with your employers as well. I mean, um, Rosalind, in terms of the advice that you would give to people, because we are getting all sorts of people getting in touch with us, some people um, having a, a stillbirth just a few weeks ago, some a few years ago, all of them they seem they, they want, they've got something to say and all of them might need so much, so much more support and help. I mean, what would your advice be to anybody going through this? I think it's really important to seek help if you, if you want to talk about things. For me, I needed to connect with other people who'd been through the same thing and I needed to know that I wasn't alone. And that massively helped me just to join support groups. I created a support group. I went to the SANS meetings and... I think it's really important to be able to talk to people and just to know that you're not alone. And I think also be confident. And if you want to talk about your baby and you want to share a picture, then just be confident and do it and focus on the people that are there for you. I mean, Rachel, we've heard <laughs> some shocking stories, some good stories, some positive um, stories as well. In terms of changing, changing attitudes, um, do you think that's happening? Do you think just us talking about it today will change those attitudes? I think the fact that so many people are talking about it, that, you know, there's ladies here that write blogs. Um, I do a little bit of that myself. Um, and 
I meet people through the baby loss community all the time and we're able to share our stories and you know that's that's the beauty of social media really that we've been able to do that um, and I think that is creating a sea change in attitudes and people are becoming more aware which is you know is how it should be. I mean David um, you set up um, a charity named after your daughter Grace and essentially you go around the world talking to people talking to other parents educating um, people um, in terms of stillbirth even supporting those who've gone through that um, in terms of attitudes do, do you do you see that changing? Uh, very much so. so. Even since um, Grace died uh, four years ago, uh, people are much, there's much more conversations happening. And when people have a loss, they tend to want to do something. And there's so many charities being set up. And they're providing so much support to the NHS, which kind of should have been there anyway. But um, the, uh, the other thing that really uh, just gets in my head is that, it was mentioned earlier, it's almost two and a half times uh, ethnic minorities that have stillbirths more than the average white uh, woman. And yet no one talks about that. And I don't know, I look at a lot of the publicity out there and there's not a lot of black people on that publicity. But if those stats are right, then surely they should be, or maybe I'm just a bit crazy like that. Um, but you think <laughs> the thing that really, really will make a difference in people taking note is terminology. So we've got this beautiful thing on the floor, it says stillbirth, still a taboo. Mm -hmm. And actually maybe more people would take notice if we stop saying stillbirth. It's a lovely medical term mm -hmm. that says what we need it to say, but if people understood that stillbirth really meant mm -hmm. baby death, and that was the term we used, maybe people would stop being funny about it and go, oh, it's death. Stillbirth by another name is death. Maybe our attitudes will change. Mary, how do you feel about the term stillborn? Um, it was only up until last year that I could use it. When people ask the question of how many children do you have, and obviously I think we can all relate that it's the most awkward question you could be asked, um, I could never say she was stillborn. And I, I was finding, tripping over my words all the time, trying to find what to say. And then in the end someone said, oh, well, your baby was stillborn, that's what happened. And, and like David said, yeah, medically that is what happened, but my baby died. But if you say my baby died, it's like somebody will cringe and hide away and it's the most awkward word you could use in, the, in a conversation of those two words in the same sentence. I mean, Kevin, is, is that important to you to, to make sure that Cheyenne is, is acknowledged, people know his name, people know him? Definitely. Um, I talk about him to people, want people to know that he was there. Um, people ask us... Um, ask me how many children do you have that's probably one of the most uh, frequent questions you get asked and um, so I've got two um, but unfortunately we have to say um, he was still born so um, yeah, it's one of those things I mean Antonia Elaine in terms of in terms of your experience your experience together as well working together um, is that the crucial thing for you making sure that your children are acknowledged and remembered I think it's everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely everything. They are as important, certainly to me, I think, to us mm -hmm. as our living children. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think often people focus on our living children and not on the child who's passed away, but they mean absolutely everything. I love her as much as I love my son. Mm. Definitely. I'm, I light a candle every single Friday night. I light for each of my children, and one of those candles is for Rufka and Hashana. So I think about that all the time, but especially when I light candles on a Friday night. Mm. Um, and I say, as I'm lighting the candles, I say to myself, this is for that child, this is for that child, and this one's for Efkin Shoshana. I mean, to anybody watching, this could be a revelation, because I have to say that the idea of remembering a child that's died, people in trying to do the right thing would think, actually, let's not do that, let's not mention this child because it might be hard on the parent. But with a show of hands, how important, how much should, in your opinion, should a child be acknowledged, be remembered, even by name? You all agree? That's interesting. That's so interesting. I didn't even realise that myself. Um, guys, really, really good talking to you. Thank you so much for um, speaking to Tessa Chapman, um, telling her your experiences and coming on the show on Five News tonight with this special. I have to say it has been an eye-opener for everybody involved, including myself. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your messages and for keeping that conversation going. You can keep talking on our Facebook page, um, but for myself and all of us here, I've got to say goodbye. Have yourself um, a very good night. Hopefully see you tomorrow night at 6.30 for another 5 News Tonight. Goodbye.